everyone. This is the Crime Cafe, your podcasting source of great crime, suspense, and thriller writing. I'm your host, Debbie Mack. Before I bring on my guest, I'll just remind you that the Crime Cafe has two ebooks for sale the nine book box set and the short story anthology. You can find the buy links for both on my website, debbiemack.com, under the Crime Cafe link. You can also get a free copy of either book if you become a Patreon supporter. You'll get that and much more if you support the podcast on Patreon, along with our eternal gratitude for doing so. But first, let me put in a good word for Blueberry Podcasting. I'm a Blueberry affiliate, but that's not the only reason I'm telling you this. I've been using Blueberry Podcasting as my hosting service for my podcast for years, and it's one of the best decisions I ever made. They give great customer service, you're in complete control of your own podcast, you can run it from your own website, and it just takes a lot of the work out of podcasting for me. I find for that reason that it's a company that I can get behind 100% and say, you should try this. Try Blueberry. It doesn't require a long-term contract, and it's just a great company, period. And it also has free technical support by email, video, and phone. So you can get a human being there. Isn't that nice? Hi, everyone. Before I introduce my guest, I'll just mention that my latest novel, Fatal Connections, is out now. It's the second Erica Jensen mystery. And since Erica is a female Marine veteran, Veterans Day seemed like a good day to have it released. So uh, it's, uh, if you like hard-boiled mystery, please check it out. Yes, it's all at all the usual retailers. So do check it out, including Amazon, of course. But with me today is a guy who writes about motorcycle clubs, or as it's described on his website, Biker Noir. I like that description. You should totally check out his uh, writing sample um, on his website. It's really awesome. And with me today, then, is Ian Park. Hi, Ian. How are you doing? Hi. Very well, thank you. Greetings from across the pond uh, on a awesome. fairly grotty November night. <laughs> it's kind of grotty around here. It's not night, but it's been rainy. It actually was kind of nice. It cleared up and, well, we kind of went from rain to cleared up, so it was not so bad. Really, when you come down to yeah. it, you, you can tell you're talking something from England because we're onto the weather already. I mean, that's that's what we talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we talk about in Maryland too. That's interesting. Very, very interesting. <laughs> um, I got to tell you though, um, I noticed you have an MBA uh, and an interesting background in solvency and business restructuring. So the fact that yes. you kind of drew on that experience to write a conspiracy thriller as a novel seemed to suggest something dire? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I I, I did an MBA um, and was interested in running businesses and uh, set out effectively to have a career in running businesses and and doing things in the sort of distressed business space. And I won't bore you with the career history, but essentially at one point I ended up, um, I wanted to get a, a secondment. I was working for PwC, one of the big firms at the time. And I wanted a secondment to Canada. Uh, and I ended up in Tanzania, uh, which just proves my geography is fairly lousy. Um, so from going to the West Coast of Canada to, to going to East Africa, uh, I ended up sort of running a, a match factory um, with about a thousand employees, including 300, pe- 300 ladies putting matches into boxes by hand uh, on the slopes of Kilimanjaro for a year. Um, and I, I spent two and a half years out there doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things, really. And it was, it was a very interesting fish out of water experience. Um, uh, all the sort of cultural shock that you get by going to a very different culture. And I started writing something. Uh, I, I spent a very drunken evening, very drunken New Year's Day, um, visiting a friend who had a hut up on Kilimanjaro who was working with um, the local farmers. And, and during the day I read, uh, before we got very drunk on New Year's Eve, 
I read um, John le Carre's Smiley's um, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And then the next day with a thumping hangover, um, I read uh, an Ian Banks novel. And I remember sitting there thinking, the, the, the Le Carre, I was fascinated by how he'd got that atmosphere, the sort of bureaucracy and, and, and that. And then the, the Ian Banks novel, I was just fascinated by how he'd managed to get such a complicated plot to then all work through. And I remember, I, I literally remember sitting there thinking, oh, that's really interesting. Could I do that? Um, and then I started writing something. And to be honest, it, to start with, it was really just therapy about being this fish out of water somewhere in East Africa, doing all these odd things. Um, and it turned into a, a sort of political conspiracy um, novel called The Liquidator. Uh, and if anybody's going on a safari holiday, I just recommend not taking it because you don't want to be caught with it at customs, to be honest. Um, but it was it was just a fascinating thing to do and I, I really wrote it for me um as a as a getting something out of my system almost um and i wrote this thing and it was 180,000 words long and it was far too long and i came back home and it went in a drawer and i forgot about it for 10 years um until i was uh, at one stage i left a company and i had a two three month sort of um garden leave period where I you know wasn't supposed to be working on anything else so I thought took this out of the drawer and thought well actually I really ought to finish this um and I sort of rewrote it about two or three times from different viewpoints uh, and I sent it I had the great fortune of sending it to my brother if, if you were a writer what you need is somebody rude I sent it to my brother who was a at the time a, a sub-editor on a local newspaper and I sent in the first three chapters and said what do you think of this and about two weeks later, back came this envelope and he put a big red line through all of chapter one and just written police on it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like, take out all this self-indulgent stuff. And eventually it slimmed down. It ended up being sort of 100,000 words out of 180. And I thought, right, I'm going to I'm going to I couldn't find an agent or anybody who's interested. So I decided I would self-publish it. And I thought, right, I've got that out of my system. I've done it. And I thought, OK, so I've, I've done that. And I, I really enjoyed writing it. And I've, I have another career in writing business books to do with the MBA and restructuring, et cetera. And I'm, I'm a sort of published author through traditional means on that. Um, and I just, I'd got into the habit of writing by that stage. So I, I sat down to what else am I interested in writing about? And I've, I've, I'm, I'm a lifelong biker. Uh, and I've always been interested in sort of the, the far edge of that scene, if you like. And, and I was really irritated by the fact that the way bikers tend to be presented in, in the media tends to be sort of fairly Neanderthal. Um, you know, you come across them as comedy villains in East Clint Eastwood films, et cetera. And I thought, actually, you know, this is, you know, whatever you think about it, it's a very serious lifestyle and people commit to it very seriously and take it very seriously and deserve to be treated seriously. Uh, and so why is no, and, and actually it's a, to me, it was a fascinating area of, of, of life. And I thought, why is nobody writing fiction set in that? There's loads of fiction about the mafia, you know, and all other sort of you know, areas of crime, but why is nobody writing anything about that? And I thought, well, if nobody else is doing it, and there's this thing about write what you'd be interested in reading. So I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll write about it. Um, so I started to write a book which was about um, a character called Damage and how he got involved in the, the sort of biker scene and the choices that led him to make and how that 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 worked out. And it was really just supposed to be a one off story. And I, I finished that and, and, and published it and it, it started to do quite well. And I had no intention of doing anything more in that scene. I thought I'd go on to do other things. I had loads of other other projects I wanted to do. And then about three or four months after I published it two of the characters met up in my head for a meeting and they were off you know they just started and I was just along for the ride essentially <laughs> um, for the ride that's so how they appropriate com they completely took on and and and, and, and that, so they did it they they started this thing that led to a second book uh, and I remember talking to somebody who'd done reviews of the first one I said oh by the way I've done a I've done a follow-up and they said, how the hell have you done that? 
on the basis that you've killed off most of the so my tip for writing a successful series don't kill off all your characters in book one because <laughs> <laughs> fundamental mistake <laughs> yeah, um, so, yeah so i yeah so i wrote i wrote a second and then i wrote a third and that seemed to finish off a trilogy um and then and then that's turned into another three books which are not which are other other books set within the same world and within the same characters um so they're sort of extensions across different aspects um and uh and, and they've become sort of a cult i have to say that very carefully um but i i've been regard referred to as a sort of cult author um which is quite flattering i have to say um and they they the first trilogy got picked up for uh to be developed for tv um hasn't actually been made so i've been through a whole load of development hell so i can talk for hours about the tv process to anybody who wants to listen um so it's, it's no it's been a fun ride i have to say so far yeah yeah i, I could definitely talk to you about that because uh, i know a little bit about that myself <laughs> um let's see. <laughs> damage is such it's a, a very nice... painful process isn't it oh it is isn't it <laughs> and it's a very long and complicated process that i don't think people really appreciate <laughs> or know about that much yeah. no but um no, no. i do like the name damage it just seems to kind of encapsulate a type of character how did you create this character did you draw from experience with particular people um well a, a confession time in that damage was one of my nicknames as a kid um so, so i use <laughs> that a, a lot of the a lot of the names i used in the first book would i mean there's a lot of in jokes essentially in the first book and a lot of the names are people that i knew around the the biker scene when i was in my you know teens 20s early 30s uh, and and damage was one of the nicknames that I was given for various reasons. Um, <laughs> and where it where it came from, there's there's. So I've never been in a in that type of club. I've I've never been an associate of that type of club. You know, I'm just not in that scene. Uh, but I knew people who were sort of around it type thing. Um, and, and ran across people in, in sort of that sort of club and, and have had odd conversations with people. So I knew that you sort of got a feel for it, if you like. Um, and being around the sort of the biker scene, there would be events and, and things you'd go to and you'd see things that sort of percolated into what's in the number of the books. So, so quite a lot of the books have got things in them or vignettes which are real because they're things I always saw or, or, or friends of mine were involved with that sort of try and anchor it in reality, if you like. Um, and I, I'm also somebody I've, I've always been, I say, I've always been fascinated in the area ever since I read Hunter S. Thompson's, you know, book Hell's Angels. Uh, I've always read anything I could find or, or that came out about it. Um, and, and so I've, I've, I've built up a library of, of books over the years. And actually, since I first started writing, there have been a lot more come out because a lot of um, a lot of guys who were of an age, if you like, are starting to sort of retire, if you like, and tell their memoirs. So there was a there was quite a stage where there wasn't very much written. So your research was narrowed to quite a quite a few limited number of books but the volume of sort of memoirs and people's life stories that have been coming out over the past five six years um has sort of mushroom so it, it's a bit difficult to keep on top of to be honest um but it's what i tried to do was get a f i tried to generate something that felt right um that that felt like the way that a group of guys would operate would operate and, and feel and the sort of way they would interact and 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 the, the sort of rituals and processes that they would put in place and i mean i've had some feedback from from people in the scene who've gone you, you know nothing to, nothing like our club mate type 
Um, but I've also had quite a bit of feedback that yes, it feels right. It res respects um, uh, respects the sort of the 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 the, the, the feel of it and and um, yeah, feels authentic. And and I can't really ask for more than that to be honest. Um, when I, when somebody comes back and says yes, that feels a sort of authentic feel to it, you know. That's brilliant. That's that's my job done. Tick. Thank you very much. Um, I've achieved what I wanted to achieve. Yes, um, absolutely. I mean, it's fiction, but at the same time, you want it to feel real. And to do that, you've got to yeah. capture those authentic details. You have to capture the facts yeah. as well as create the fiction, right? Yeah. I mean, my, 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 I had a I had a one star review at one stage, and I can't remember which book it was on now. But I had a one star review and it's my favorite ever review. Well, no, not my favorite ever review, but I really like it because essentially it was I got halfway through this book before I realized it was fiction. And, and you know, damn authors making stuff up. You know, it's not right, is it really? <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, yes, wow. thank you very much. I'll take that. I'll take that one star review. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is unique. Um... What is the most the worst example you can think of of the way uh, bikers are misrepresented, and say the best example of the way they are correctly represented? Um, <laughs> the worst. Oh, don't. How long have you got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Something that really. I mean, I, I, so, the, the thing, the things that really, the thing that really bugs me, I suppose, and it's the one I keep coming back to. Is the sort of the 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 sort of lazy comedy villain type thing. Um, so I mean, and the, and the example I would point to really is the Clint Eastwood every any which way but loose films, where you have a you know a a biker club called the Black Widows who are the sort of you know bumbling you know evil incarnate type thing. But yeah, you know, just keep yeah you know, if, if their bikes don't fall over in a, in, a, in 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 the next 30 seconds you know something's gone wrong with the scene to be honest um and that that just that just irritates me because you know i i know a lot of bikers and you know there are bright guys um and it it's it, it's a sort of trope i mean it, it gets through into you've it pops up in the sopranos at one point you know, and, and you, I've got a lot of time for the Sopranos as, as a as a TV series, but you know they run a you know, Tony and um, Christopher run across you know, a biker group called the Vipers, and you know basically steal their booze, and it's you know it's a big ha ha type moment, but it just just irritates me. Um, in terms of good represent or, or presentations of bikers, um, you might might need to leave that with me to. <laughs> To have a bit of a think because um <laughs> I, I i struggle a bit to be honest uh, there are some i have to say there are some good documentaries um from back in the in the 70s certainly in the uk on the biker scene um where some journalists took the time to actually get to know and present the guy's lifestyle um in a sort of sensible and sort of non-judgmental way um yeah it didn't make it look particularly attractive but you know it was at least it seemed a bit honest as an approach type thing um i mean honest honesty i suppose is all <laughs> all i'm really asking for uh, it's not much to ask really <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty cool that's great um those documentaries do they go into things like mods and rockers <laughs> um those particular ones don't because they were particularly so focused on the clubs. The modern rocker scene in the UK was a sort of an earlier phenomenon in the early 60s. Um, and actually, I use it in one of um, one of the books that isn't part of the first trilogy in that I, I have a plot which involves um, a, a guy going to look for somebody who's disappeared. And the guy who's disappeared is one of the sort of founding fathers of, of a club and has a history going back into the mods and rockers period. So I use that as a way to get in and explore mods and rockers. And, and one of the things about the mods and rockers period, how it's presented is, is quite, I find it's quite, again, it's about, it's about myths and tropes. So 
the the myth is you have a group called the mods on their scooters and they all they, they, they all star in a quadrophenia film and they go down to, to to brighton and then there's a completely separate mob called the rockers who just appear and they have a big punch up and go away again the reality if you sort of dive into it is there wasn't actually that much of that sort of big punch ups really and i don't know about your school days but when i was at school and i was you know in the sort of punk era in my class there were some punks there were some guys who were getting into the early stage of heavy metal there were the disco kids there were the new romantics we were all in the same class we all knew each other we all went to the same parties more or less you know and we all went you know would would go to to different things so so it's not like there was some completely separate tribe of mods and some completely separate tribe of rockers and they never knew each other you know they were just all parts of the same um milieu you'd have kids who were mods and kids who don't rock, were rockers who would know each other be at school together etc and that whole just there are two tribes and they're completely divided and never the twain shall meet i think is is rubbish frankly you know they did meet they did have relationships they did know each other you know they'd have girlfriends who would swap between one one tribe and another boyfriends who'd swap oh yeah you know uh, it's it's a more complicated and nuanced picture than mod rockers fight you know allows mm -hmm. for and that's that's what part of what interests me in all of this it's the nuances of what people why people are really doing things and what their relationships are and what their choices are and how it interacts with their life and kids and family and you know people aren't people aren't tropes they are people and they're much more complicated and that's what makes them interesting exactly which it's is a psychology. bit of a load to put on a bike book about bikers <laughs> <laughs> do you um do you think hundred thompson's book kind of opened the door for all this or was there a book before this that did that um i think hunter s thompson's book is is the sort of the, the ground zero i think about writing about this subject um there were other people doing bits and pieces of writing about it at the time. So Tom Wolf um, has written bits, they pop up in, in that and sort of, um, uh, his writing about Ken Kesey and that sort of thing. Um, there were there have been photo books um, and articles, etc. So Thompson wasn't alone in writing about the scene. But he created, I think, what is the the Ur stone of all the writing that has followed um and and but interestingly and uh, there's there's a book by um george worthen who was a sort of contemporary hell's angel at the time um and it sort of reads like the companion if you read it it's sort of the companion piece so it's almost like what was happening when hunter s thompson wasn't around <laughs> so this hunter s thompson tells you this bit and then in the background you got this sort of stuff going on etc so um so it makes quite an interesting sort of compare and contrast read, if you like. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so so I, Hunter, has, if if you're reading anything on this, this scene, you need to start with Hunter S. Thompson because everything else will read will refer to it or back from it. I read uh, Hunter Thompson's book on this a long time ago. I got to tell you, and I always thought it was just an amazing book. I was just amazed at what he had done. <laughs> and how yes, things and, ended and up <laughs> what you yeah uh, but what you then get into is the is the degree to which there is then debate about how much of it is reality and how much of it is fiction very uh, good uh, question in hundred times um, <laughs> or fictionalized if you like um so uh, uh, uh an opinion is divided let's put it that way <laughs> <laughs> well he was quite a a writer he was quite a um mm. I don't know, how can I say this nicely? Creative fiction or creative uh, nonfiction writer. <laughs> Let's put it yeah. that way. Oh, yes. I, I, having read having read the Hells Angels, but I mean, I went on to read everything else that was available from him <laughs> at the time in the last Fear and Loathing Las Vegas on the campaign trail. Um, I never I never managed really to get into the rum diaries. Like that was a step too far, I think. Um, but, but um, his fear and loathing stuff was brilliant. Absolutely. I can't agree with you more. 
definitely. Um, let's see. Uh, what writers inspire you most? What do you like to read? Um, Apart from the well, biker books. Yeah, I know. Well, what writers inspire me and what books I want to read are probably two slightly different things, I suppose. Um, one of the things that inspired me to write Heavy Duty People, the first book, was Machiavelli, The Prince. Um, and actually, there's quite, again, again, there's quite an in-joke running through Heavy Duty People um, in relation to The Prince. If you read the two side by side, there's, a, uh, there's some parallels that you'll see. Um, I, I'm interested. I read for pleasure, and I also read to understand. Um, so, and by understand, I mean to find out things and also to understand how other people write. So I will read stuff, to, I will read stuff that I don't particularly want to read, but just to see how it's constructed, how the, how the author makes things work. Um, but I mean, my, my leisure reading, I suppose, tends to be either um, fairly heavyweight histories. Um, and if I'm, if I'm reading fiction, I'll read things like uh, James Elroy. Um, uh, I'll, I'll read Robert Harris. Um, again, who I read regularly in terms of how do you, how do you do something that works that well? Um, uh, um, I, 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 Ian Rankin, um, to an extent. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly, fairly mainstream, I suppose, in my reading tastes um, in terms of fiction. And then I say quite a lot of fairly heavy history. Um, again, because I'm interested in people and, and, and how, they, how they work and what they do. And um, there's sort of little foibles that come out, uh, dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, what are you working on now? Um, well, having done having done six of these biker books, I have a seventh that I've probably been working on for about three, if not four years, um, and never quite getting to to finish. Um, and I'm not sure where, why. Partly it's because I think it's it, effectively it would tie up the whole of the series and bring a lot of loose ends together. And I've tried writing it about three or four times and, and keep getting to a point where it sort of breaks down. And I, I, I keep trying to address that. Um, but what I'm doing at the moment is I've also started a publishing company. Um, so in addition to me writing, I suppose I'm slightly being distracted by working with other authors and what they are putting out. I mean, I, I did write another book after the, the Biker series, uh, which was a little sort of conspiracy theory um, all about how the British um, bombed Pearl Harbor uh, in 1941, <laughs> or arranged the bombing of Pearl Harbor in 1941. Um, so so if, if you want to know how that worked, <laughs> I'm That's awesome. to tell you. <laughs> oh my God. Um, uh, it's, well, again, it was a bit. It was it was that was inspired by by reading odd bits of history and coming across various little tropes, and you sort of stuck three or four things together and thought, oh, actually, you know that that makes a sort of logical sense. Um, so building on about three or four real historical facts, I get from where we are now to. Yes, the British actually organising the bombing of Pearl Harbour in order to bring America into the war and save us, um, which sort of makes a logical sense. It um, does, anyway, actually. So, so, yeah, so I... I... <laughs> Isn't this awesome? Um, yeah, so, so that, that, one, that one's called Best... If anybody wants to read, read that and find their, their understanding of history turned upside down, that's called Best of Enemies. So, um... Best of Enemies? <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm expecting to create a diplomatic incident between. <laughs> between yes, our let's indeed create an international incident here. All right. <laughs> yeah, well, it's 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 one way to get some publicity, you know. You know there you go. There's no break. such thing as bad publicity, right? Yeah, yeah. 
break up the journals. NATO alliance and, and get yeah, get international incident to generate some coverage for your book. Yeah, I can't see a problem with that. I, I could say something here about certain US presidents, but I won't. I won't. Yeah, no. But... <laughs> I won't. Yeah, probably best not to go there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, not doing that. Nope, yeah. nope, nope. Uh, what advice yeah, so, would so you? I thought... <laughs> yes. So, so, so at the moment, it, my writing, my writing has sort of taken a back seat to working with other authors and getting their stuff out. Um, and I, funny enough, I've, I've started writing some bits and pieces this this week um, during the evenings. Um, so whether they will actually then get me back into the groove of writing. Um, let's see. Well, I hope so. I hope so. Because I think that's a great thing, you know, to write. Mm. If you can write, you should write. And um, well, and the, the, and the thing is, you on, on Facebook, I used to get all this grief on Facebook. Because every time I go on Facebook to post something, I get fans. And they come back, what are you doing on Facebook? Why aren't you changing the typewriter getting your next book out? And you, I, I used to get, you know, bollockings from fans on, you know, for, for not being sat there writing. Oh my gosh, that's kind of like the total opposite of what they tell you. It's like, oh, be on Facebook so that you can connect with everybody, and and you have all your fans saying, <laughs> get off Facebook and go yeah. write something. Don't, don't, yeah, don't connect with me. Just get on with writing and stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, let's see. Big. I was going to say, what advice would you give to anybody who aspires to get published or publish themselves? Get lucky. Get lucky. Um, get writing and get lucky, I think is the honest answer to that. Amen um, to that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and actually, this is a conversation I've had with, with um, a number of people. Um, let's say because we're now publishers and you get people, you know, my son or my cousin is trying to write. Could you have a chat with them type thing? And yeah, my, my advice is essentially that, get writing. Because if you don't write, you're not a writer. You just need to keep writing and, and write and write and write. So get writing, get a rude friend who will go through and say, that's rubbish. Because um, if you give it to your mum and she says it's fantastic, you know, that does not really help you. Um, and the third thing is just get lucky because it is such a crapshoot. Um, and, and I suppose the fourth thing is get responsible. Um, you as a writer are responsible for your own success. You've got to make it happen. Whether you're a published author by a publishing house or not, at the end of the day, it's your career. You need to, 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 to make it work. Um, so you do need to be, you know, the, the, and I, I dread the sort of social media side of it. You know, if, if I was social, I wouldn't be sitting in my room writing books, to be honest. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. But but you do have to engage with an audience and build yourself a, a, a fan base and interact with them, etc. So social media is a necessary evil in this day and age. Um, but you do have to take responsibility for getting out there and selling your stuff. You can't just hand it over. You can't just sit there, write something, think I've built a better, I've written a better mouse trick. The world is going to beat a path to my door. Hand it to a um, a publisher. You know, the publisher is not going to take your, and this, we put a bit on, on our new, on our publishing website, we put a little guide for authors. It's a tough love thing, essentially. And it says, you, you may understand, you may have this vision that, you know, you write this fantastic book and it's going to be, it's going to be a world star and you send it off to, to us as publishers. And, and we, we decide, yeah, fantastic. We're going to publish this. And we have a bit of to and fro about the cover and, you know, a bit of Barney about that. Uh, and then, you know, we as publishers assemble our crack sales team of, of, of book salesmen in, in, a, in a big hall and stand up on the podium and say, right, we have this wonderful book. You should go out and sell it to all the bookshops. Off you go. And they all go rah, 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 and run out to sell your books. That's not how it happens. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, it's a much more difficult process. Bookshops are only going to sell your stock your book if there is an audience they think is going to buy it, you know. You can't go to bookshops and say, will you take my book and sell it for me? What bookshops want is you selling it so people come to them to buy it. You know, and one of the interesting things of working with authors as, we're now, as I'm now doing running a publishing company is talking to people about 
how the book selling process works, why people buy books and what they need to do as authors in order to be able to sell. Yeah. You know, and, uh, and you sit there and have a conversation with, know. why did you buy, yeah, why did you, why did you buy the last book you bought? Yeah, is one of the questions I'll ask. And it's probably because you've read something by that author before and you liked it. Your mate told you about it and said, you really ought to read this because you, you, you'll like it. It's been on the TV. And so it's a tie in. Um, it's written by some you know, celebrity. Um, you know, there's a whole raft of reasons that, that people buy books. And you have uh, most of which do not apply to a first time author. You know, so be aware this is a sort of marathon, not a sprint um so we have we have quite a lot of crunchy conversations with authors about what the reality of the life is um, there's a definite hierarchy so. in terms of who gets attention how also mm. yeah yeah I mean, definitely it's definitely. just undeniable and it's a yeah. kind of a financial reality for the publishing industry as well you know oh yeah yeah, That's I mean, we're, we're publishing to. and yeah, we're, we're publishing and frankly, it's a money pit. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a, we have a budget that we set for each book we put out. And essentially, I mean, from my business background, I treat us as essentially a business incubator. What I'm looking to find is somebody who's got a good product in terms of the book who I think has got the business acumen to get out there and build and develop a career. And what we are doing is we're coming in to fund that and give the support to the launch and, and start of that career, essentially. But they will need to, to really make it work. So, yes, yeah, so we have quite a substantial budget that we put into each book that we are launching in the full expectation that we will lose all that money because it will sell bugger all copies. And you are you are funding um, essentially a portfolio to see, you know, and, and, and same with as a, as a venture capitalist, you know, I'm going to fund 10 things in the full knowledge that, you know, six of them are going to completely sell nothing and disappear. Two or three are going to sort of bubble along and make a, you know, eventually get me back my money. And what I'm looking for is the one that becomes a good hit because that's what pays for all the rest and then everybody should go on and re repeat the thing. Um, that so that's, that's the, publishing the business model right the there. Mm. I'm sorry, mm. go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, that's so that's, how publishing that's, that's works. the business model. Yeah, exactly. Um, so yes, yeah, so we're busy putting stuff out and, and looking for our big hit that makes it all, you know, looking for our equivalent of Harry Potter that makes it all worthwhile. You know. <laughs> that's, I think that's fantastic. I think what you're doing is fantastic. And um, is there anything else you'd like to say before we finish up? Uh, presumably not just buy my book, because that would be dull. <laughs> um. <laughs> Where can people find you online? Um, yeah, yeah, we, I mean, uh, online. So um, my, my personal um, publishing website um, for my books is bad-press.co.uk, and that's where you'll find my biker books and other books um and then badpress.inc inc is is our publishing website where we're publishing um the, the the other people's books um and it's it's an eclectic mix um there's 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 some interesting stuff on there um from cry, female led crime fiction um through to sort of fairly comic horror type stuff so it's it's quirky and it's quite niche um and we're uh, uh, we, we're doing all sorts of interesting stuff. We've um, we've <laughs> we've just published we've just published that. Okay. Cool. Um, for, and and you think what the hell is that? Forestfriends.inc. <laughs> um, and it's got that has got it, 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 yes. Um, so this this is a guy who does comic um, essentially comic images on the internet. He, he's got 400,000 Twitter followers, 400,000 um, social media followers. Um, so we've put out a collection of his sort of quite weird and wonderful comic images. 
And that's one of the sort of weird things that we are doing. And, and I have to say, it's great. The publishing side of it is great fun. Working with other authors to, to, to help make them a success and get them working with each other, because we've tried to instill a sort of communal ethos so that people promote each other's stuff. Um, and that's 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 a really great fun thing to be doing. Uh, there's, I was talking to a bookshop owner and she said, you know, nobody does anything in publishing for money. You, everybody does it for love. Uh, and I think there's, a, if you don't come into it for do it for love, you are going to get, you know, you're going to get out of it quite quickly. You will be um, sorely disappointed. We, yeah, obviously <laughs> we, yeah. And we are, I mean, we're, we're doing this because we are trying to create a, a viable, sustainable business. So it obviously has to make the return, et cetera. But if, if we didn't love it, we wouldn't do it. I'd find something else to do with my time and money. Thank you very much. So true. Um, Absolutely true. I couldn't have said it better. That's great. Um, well, I think what you're doing is fantastic, Ian. I just want to thank you for being here so much. Thanks for talking well, with us. Thank you. I was, I, I, I was looking at it. I think this is, is this, is this show number 141 or something of the series? So oh my congratulations. Gosh. <laughs> I, I, I shall have to actually count them at some point. We're in season seven and it's the 11th episode of season seven, I believe. <laughs> so, so congratulations think, on, on, on setting this up and getting it going. I have to say that, that, that again, that's a labor of love, isn't it? It is. It truly is. And it, it, I got to tell you, it is amazing how it has taken off. I've got guests book, uh, booked into 2023. Yeah. Can you believe that? I, I don't well, believe it. Great. Hopefully I'll still be around. <laughs> Excellent. Well, uh, long may you run. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. And the same to you as well. That's awesome. Um, thank you very much. Cheers. Cheers. Yes, indeed. Um, on that note, well, I will... <laughs> I will just switch back okay. to myself and uh, say okay. that uh, remember everybody that the Crime Cafe has two ebooks the nine book box set and the short story anthology with contributors from the first season of the Crime Cafe. And uh, when you get your Kindle or whatever device you like uh, for Christmas, keep that in mind as something that you can download. And uh, we are Patreon supported also, I would like to remind you. So please check out our Patreon page. And with that, I will just say we are taking a short break for the holiday here in this country that celebrates eating a lot, <laughs> I guess. And um, our next guest after the short break will be John Gaspard. In the meantime, take care and happy reading.